Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about the remarkable origin story of sharks. Sharks have been around for over 400 million years. In fact, it might surprise you to know that sharks are not only older than dinosaurs, they're older than trees and the rings around the planet Saturn. Sharks are incredible survivors, even managing to survive the KT extinction, a catastrophe that wiped out 75% of all life on the planet. Not only did sharks survive this catastrophe, but they managed to bounce back bigger than ever taking on the role as the ocean's top predator and never looking back. But what is it about sharks that makes them so special? How did they survive when animals such as plesiosaur and mosasaur went extinct? The answer to this has to do with design. Sharks took their design inspiration from cruise missiles. This allowed them to overcome the perils of mother nature. Thanks to their military inspired design, sharks have remained largely unchanged for over millions of years. Okay, none of that is true. Still, when you think of sharks, you probably think of something like this, the Great White. This shark has become the archetype for all sharks, including the most famous prehistoric shark of all, the Megalodon. But Megalodon wasn't even related to the Great White. And while at first glance their teeth might look similar, when we look a little closer, there are some important differences. The secret to the long-term survival of sharks lies not in their perfection, but in trial and error. The diversification of shark species and their ability to adapt to changing environments help them to not only survive the KT extinction, but multiple mass extinctions throughout the Permian and Triassic periods. It's an incredible survival story with some of the wackiest animal designs you've ever seen. And it all started, wait, that's too far back. There we go. Here we are in the middle of the Paleozoic era, also known as the Devonian period. During this time, our planet is still mostly covered by water and we are just starting to see plants and animals establish themselves on land. Meanwhile, life in the ocean has undergone several changes, coming out of a nightmare fuel period where giant sea scorpions ruled the oceans. The Devonian period is where we really see life in the ocean explode. It's here where we see our first true species of sharks. This little fellow is Cladosalaki, one of the earliest species of sharks. These early sharks had evolved streamlined bodies, including that iconic upper dorsal fin. Their bodies appeared very shark-like. However, they were just starting their evolutionary journey, still maintaining a few fish-like characteristics, such as their jaws. Compared to the jaws of most modern sharks, the jaws of Cladosalaki were still weak and very fish-like. In order to make it to the status of apex predator, sharks would need time and some clever survival tactics. And when it comes to survival, nothing beats reproduction. Ladies, let me introduce you to the anvil shark, Stethacanthus. This shark was a real ladies' man, spouting whatever this is as its dorsal fin with a similar brush-like obstruction on top of its head. Let's talk about that dorsal fin. Since we have yet to find females with the same stylish headwear, it's speculated that the upper dorsal fin might have been used as part of a mating ritual. Similar to male peacocks, Stethacanthus is an amazing example of just how strange evolution can be. It's also not a shark. It's a chimera. What's a chimera? A chimera is a shark-like creature. So I guess this video is about sharks and shark-like creatures. The Devonian period is referred to as the age of fishes. And as we transition into the Carboniferous period, we start to see shark diversity explode as well. It's here where sharks get weird. Let's start by taking a look at one of my favorites from this period, Adestus. No, this isn't something out of Sid's room. Adestus was a scissor tooth shark. Its serrated teeth would protrude forward and when closed would interlock, creating a vice grip around their prey. At three to five meters in length, Adestus was comparable to the size of a modern great white. These buzzsaw sharks were prevalent up until the end of the Paleozoic, a period known as the Permian. Here is where we see the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea and where one of the most interesting shark-like species made its debut. It's called Helicaprion a world tooth shark that's become the model for all sharks with that remarkable buzzsaw-like set of teeth. It's also wrong. Helicoprion has baffled scientists for years, and it's easy to see why. Just take a look at one of their fossils. Upon first glance, you might be mistaken into thinking that this isn't a shark-like species at all, that maybe it's some kind of ammonite. But if you take a closer look, you'll see that this isn't a shell, but a continuous set of teeth that fold around a spiral-like shape. It's so wild. I mean, how on earth did an animal with a set of teeth like this even eat? That's a question scientists had as well. No species alive today has a jaw like this. For a long time, no one had the answer. Several ideas were put forward. Perhaps Helicoprion used its lower jaw like a whip to smack its prey with its sharp teeth. 
Or maybe they even use their teeth as a scraper to slice up their prey as they swam over them. So much about Helicoprion was unknown. Until recently, we couldn't even say with certainty what this animal even looked like. And scientists, along with paleo artists, had all kinds of interesting ideas and designs. And then, we had a breakthrough. In 2013, a group of scientists ran a CT scan on a well-preserved fossil of Helicoprion. The scan revealed that the majority of the spiral-shaped teeth would have been completely enclosed in its lower jaw, with only the top portion of the teeth sticking out. The scan also showed that when Helicoprion closed its mouth, these teeth would nest in the upper jaw. It's so cool! And when you think about it, this is a really clever way to pull food in. It kind of reminds me of a mining wheel, only this doesn't spin. One hypothesis as to how this jaw might have formed was that as the animal aged, their teeth would continue to push forward, creating a spiral-like structure. In addition to the bizarrely designed sharks like Helicoprion, the Permian also saw the introduction of a species of freshwater shark called Orthocanthus. Many of you are probably familiar with bull sharks who have been known to swim up rivers and survive in fresh water. But Orthocanthus didn't just survive in fresh water, they thrived. In fact, it was one of the apex predators of the freshwater river systems throughout Europe and North America. Life was good. Sharks were becoming more and more specialized and ocean life was plentiful. Then, it happened. The largest extinction event in our planet's history. The Permian Extinction, also known as the Great Dying. Large volcanoes in northern Siberia erupted, creating the Siberian Traps. These eruptions released massive amounts of toxic gas into the Earth's atmosphere and poisoned the Earth's oceans. Sharks, along with other marine animals, were mostly wiped out. Luckily, Thanks to the abundant variations of sharks and shark-like species the Paleozoic produced, a few smaller shark species managed to survive. Following this event, we enter the Mesozoic Era, where, for the next 200 million years, the Earth's oceans would be dominated by marine reptiles. But, towards the end of the Mesozoic Era, sharks started to make their comeback. Species, like Ginsu sharks, began to challenge the other marine reptiles for supremacy. The Ginsu shark was over 8 meters long and would have had teeth like knives, hence the name Ginsu shark. It appeared as though sharks were back on track to becoming the ocean's top predator. But if you watched my last video, you know that didn't happen. The Mesozoic ended with another mass extinction. An asteroid 10 kilometers wide collided with the planet and wiped out 75% of all life on Earth. By now, you're probably noticing a pattern. When catastrophe strikes, the more specialized and less diverse a species is, the less likely it is to bounce back. Sharks survived the Permian extinction thanks to their ability to adapt and diversify. However, the larger and more specialized species of sharks were not so lucky, and their absence as the ocean's apex predator gave rise to the age of marine reptiles. So it's no surprise that the KT extinction at the end of the Mesozoic saw the end of the larger shark species such as Ginsu sharks, while the smaller, more agile shark species pushed on. And now, this is where we enter the Cenozoic era, also known as the Age of Mammals. That's you guys! The great loss of life gave opportunities for new species to fill those ecological niches. Mammals came to dominate the land and the seas. In the ocean, giant leviathan whales called leviathans rose up and became one of the ocean's top predators. As for sharks, well, you know him. You love him. He pulled in millions at the box office and made you lose trust in Discovery Channel. It's Megalodon the largest shark species to ever live. Estimates on the size range of Megalodon range between 15 and 20 meters, with some putting it at a massive 25 meters. We still can't say for sure what the actual size of Megalodon was, but it's almost certainly smaller than initial estimates, and nowhere near as large as the cinematic monster we see in the movie, The Meg. But even still, Megalodon is one of the largest marine predators to ever live on this planet. The world Megalodon would have lived in would have been quite pleasant, if you're a giant shark. The warm waters gave rise to several new species of oceanic megafauna. Numerous species of now extinct whales filled the planet's oceans and made the perfect prey for the giant super predator. This all changed when roughly 4 million years ago, our planet's oceans saw some dramatic changes. The land bridge connecting North and South America was formed, cutting off the warm currents of the Atlantic. This led to a decrease in ocean temperatures and a dramatic drop in the number of oceanic megafauna. This change made it harder for Megalodon to compete with smaller, more agile sharks, including a species you are all familiar with, the Great White. Um, Napkin, maybe you haven't noticed, but Megalodon is much bigger than a Great White. How is that a competition? Oh that, I just drew him that way. But seriously, 
As we've seen throughout the history of sharks, bigger isn't always better. As the population of large marine mammals decreased, they were replaced with smaller, more agile species. Let's take a look at the great white's favorite snack, seals. To hunt seals, great whites rely on ambush tactics to catch the seal off guard. If the seal spots the shark in time, the shark misses its meal. So if you're larger than a bus, that's kind of a problem. This is where Megalodon's massive size started to work against it. Catching this type of prey expended a lot of energy. Whereas the great white could survive off of a few seals a week, Megalodon would have had to have eaten a significant number of prey its large body wasn't designed to catch. Eventually, the change in environment and lack of suitable prey led to the Megalodon's extinction. Today, when we think about Megalodon, we usually think of them as giant great whites. And it's easy to see why. Shark skeletons are made out of cartilage, which doesn't fossilize as well as calcium-rich bones. Meaning, the only thing we have to go by are the teeth and some very small vertebrae. Everything about their body is based off of educated inferences, made by comparing other shark species. When you look at a Megalodon tooth next to the tooth of a modern great white, there is a striking similarity. This led to the idea that Megalodon was a precursor species to the great white, which begs the question, why did it shrink? And the answer just might surprise you. It didn't. Megalodon and great white were two completely separate species. Let's take another look at those teeth. Enhance. More. 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 Too close. There. Take a look at those ridges. They're different. The Megalodon has more blunt ridges, while the Great White's ridges are more serrated. You also probably notice the base of these teeth also looks different. At the bottom of the Megalodon tooth, just above the base, we see a darkened area in the shape of a chevron just above the root. This area is known as the burlet, and we see it in every Megalodon tooth that we find. The teeth of the Great White show little to no burlet, implying different use cases for how these animals use their teeth. One of the ideas being that Megalodon's teeth were designed for stronger bites, while the white shark's teeth were designed for shredding. It was these subtle differences that played an important role in their interspecies competition. Now this brings up an interesting question. Is it incorrect to portray Megalodon as just a giant great white shark? If all we have is its teeth, could we not just have something like this? How do we even know it looked like a shark? We don't, but it's important to understand what drives these recreations. Megalodon and the modern great white both occupy similar niches in the food chain. While sharks to this day continue to be an incredibly diverse species, we do see a common profile among the top predatorial species of sharks. The similarity in tooth shape between Megalodon and Great Whites, as well as their role in the food chain, implies these creatures likely had other similar characteristics. Which is why for now, Megalodon is portrayed as a massive Great White. But in the future, who knows? The way we recreate extinct animals is really interesting. The Spinosaurus is a prime example of it, and it has a really cool story behind it. But unfortunately, we're out of time, so I guess we'll have to cover that in another video. Until then, I want to thank you all for watching, I look forward to seeing you next time, and don't forget to bring snacks.